Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for the 15th in a 15 part series. Uh, this series is, this video is the conclusion to the series that has been the read along and finally the review for The Shining by Stephen King. All 658 pages 659 pages uh that was the shining uh and also just to throw it out there there is concurrently to be posted a review for the movie of the shining on my personal channel for which i will uh include a link in the description below click on that link go over to that channel and there will be a review for the movie for the shining to really cap off this experience which is uh the whole thing Except for the TV series. We didn't go over that. And I think there was another movie that was The Shining. Maybe I am mistaken about that. But there was at least the Kubrick film and a TV series. But this is a review on the book The Shining. Three good things, three bad things. Quotes, literary discussion, rating, and recommendation based on the text. So let's jump right into it. Three good things. Uh, this is, if I may say it in these terms, a smooth movie going experience. Stephen King, though I, I do not hold him in the top pantheon of writers uh, that, I, that I read from time to time, I do think that he is probably uh, in that top tier of storytellers. And there is a distinction, distinction to be made between the two um, storytelling. He's got a story and he gets it to you in a painless fashion. The words on the page come one right after the other in very smooth fashion. Number two, this is not slasher type gore porn. Neither is this psychological what if type of horror. Uh, the former being uh, Jason Voorhees on a written page, the latter being um, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, for example where everything is sort of using you against yourself. What this novel does is it creates a world and it goes. It puts us in the world of the Overlook Hotel with the rules in place and it explains those rules to us as we need them um, for the most part and it does not incorporate many extracurricular things which A, I have found to be one of the things that takes me away from Stephen King from time to time. He'll just throw the kitchen sink in there. Uh, but B, it's also difficult to not have any extracurriculars in a 658-page brick of a novel. Um, and there is some stuff that there are times where Stephen King starts telling every story instead of telling his story but uh, we're sticking with these characters for the most part. We're sticking with the things that are going on and happening to them for the most part. And we are sticking to their pasts as their pasts coincide with one another for the most part. Including in that, uh, in Dick Halloran's part of the story, a character which is the Overlook Hotel itself. Uh, which, again, we can't forget that the Overlook Hotel itself is a character in this novel. The third good thing that I have written down about this book, which sort of plays on that, is the element of the shine as extracurricular to horror. We do get a bit of the horror element that is the shine, uh, namely for me in the character of Tony. Uh, that is just a creepy idea, which to Stephen King's credit, never comes across as creepy on the page. Or very rarely, at least, comes across as creepy on the page. This idea of Tony as a real thing, which is probably a dead kid, right? That is a very creepy thing, a dead kid communicating with your child, being your child's only real friend, as this family is. Uh, they carry their backpacks on themselves, right? They carry their packs on their back. Uh, they are movers, they are shakers, they are not down, tied down to any one place. And f for a kid like that, an imaginary friend might prove quite useful, even if that imaginary friend is not imaginary, but is a dead child. 
the rules of the shine are presented to us and it is not in the creepiest of fashions. The creepy part of the shine is left for us to work on ourselves in that psychological, mostly, type of way um, that something like The Haunting of Hill House works on you after time, leaves you to work on yourself, uh, turns your mind against itself, turns the reader against his or herself. Um, but extracurricular to that, we are left to think about the element of the shine and its larger life implications. Dick Halloran, for example, doesn't really talk about the spooky parts of the shine as much as he expresses the good parts of the shine, as much as he expresses the parts of the shine that allow the shine, that the parts of the shine that allow you to cope with bad things. You get that feeling of the shine before negative information is given to you. He knows about his brother's death before it is relayed to him, and it helps him to process it. Now, bad things. Three bad things about this novel. Uh, number one, characters don't develop in this novel as much as they sort of snap. And when you think about the word snap, you think about someone going crazy, which is ironic because the only character that really develops and uh, to some extent changes along the course of the novel is Jack, the one who goes crazy. So it is interesting to see that that is the character who does have some form of development uh, versus at the end, for example, Wendy comes across the injured Dick Halloran and just says, Ah, Danny will take care of it. Danny's got himself. He's, he's a little kid, but he's fine. He'll be fine. That doesn't seem like a very motherly instinct, and it certainly does not seem like the motherly instinct which had driven Wendy through the entirety of the novel. Now, some might say, well, this is serendipity. That's what this is. This is the novel presenting itself in this fashion because these are the way things have to be. Some things have to happen. Um, and this is Wendy's realization that some things have to happen. One of those things which just has to happen is that uh, Danny himself has to face his father one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's crap. There is the moment where um, Dick is called back to the Overlook Hotel, and he only argues with himself a little bit. It would have been interesting to see him argue with himself much more than that. It also would have been interesting to have, because we were in, I believe we were in Dick's head, when Dick told Danny, don't worry about calling me. If you need something, let me know. Use that noggin of yours and shout it out with the shine. It would have been interesting to see, while we were in Dick's head for that period of time in the novel, him get a little hint of the shine, a little smell of the oranges while he was sitting in the car with Danny and he didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew something bad was going to happen. And did he really want Danny to call him? And why was it that he went ahead and gave Danny the go-ahead? Not just the go-ahead. Danny probably would have had no idea that he could call out to Dick in that way had Dick not told him. Um... Number two, a furry. Really? A furry? That's what you've got for me, Stephen. A furry. Sort of what you're hinging the whole final act of this novel on is a furry. Number three, the end felt rushed compared to the rest of the novel. And I think part of that is the fact that we see elements recur through this novel, but we never really see them build. We see two states of the hedge animals, a after we understand that the hedge animals are elements of the Overlook Hotel in their full entirety. We see the hedge animals creeping along behind Jack, and then we see the hedge animals violent. We, so the second time we see the hedge animals in action, the first time we see them, they're with Jack creeping about. The second time we see them is alone with Danny, and they cause physical harm. The third time we see them is with Dick, and they cause physical harm. 
it would have been interesting that third time to see those hedge animals evolve again so that uh, what is happening is maybe the hedge animals are fighting amongst themselves, right? Something like that. Maybe the hedge animals are causing damage to other things, not just someone who is perceiving them, because that perceived damage might just be imaginary, right? Um, so if we, in, in the overarching way that anything in a horror novel might be imaginary. So if we were to see these things evolve that third time, we get a progression with them so that every time they show up, they get a little bit worse, a little bit spookier. And when they do, we are afraid to see them again because we don't know what they're going to do. In the same way, we have the elevator that runs. And the elevator starts up one night, and that's scary. That is some scary stuff. I believe it is, it's either that time or the next time we see the elevator we find ticker tape in it. But that's sort of it. Um, if we are going to sample things from uh, in reference to The Haunting of Hill House again, maybe we could fool with doors themselves after that. Um, maybe the first time we see the elevator, the elevator's just running. And that's scary stuff. The second time we see the elevator, the elevator is running. And then we find the ticker tape in it. That's scary stuff. The third time, the elevator is running, and there's stuff in the elevator. And then, as they've checked the elevator out, and it, let's just go back to the room, they turn around and... All the way down the hall, doors are being knocked on one after the other. That's the way that we sort of... The, when... Elements are building on themselves and not just recurring. Horror rises. Um, and in this, we don't really build a sense of survival horror because the elements recur but don't build on themselves. And at the end of the novel, everything turns at once. So there's a long time at the beginning of this novel where nothing is particularly creepy. We just hear that things might be bad. And Danny sees a couple things. And then all of a sudden, I, I believe it is in the, towards the end of the second third of the novel, toward maybe 280 or so, somewhere in there, that we get the, the happening with the elevator where everyone's hearing the music, something like, somewhere around that part of the novel. But um, it's from that point that everything really escalates, and then it hits homeostasis, until we get the furry, and then it's straight up. Um, those furries, those harbingers of doom. But it would have been interesting to see these elements recur and build on themselves. Uh, and I think that we lost a great deal of horror because they did not. Now, quotes, I have but five in these 659 pages. The first comes to us on page 268. <clears throat> Sorry. If I can get there. He closed his eyes and uh, he closed his eyes and tried to imagine telling Wendy. Guess what, babe? I lost another job. This time, I had to go through 2,000 miles of Bell Telephone Cable to find someone to punch, to punch out. But I managed it. That is a great encapsulation of the character of Jack. Further on, page 310... And this is just a great quote. So they went in together, leaving the wind to build to the slow-pitched scream that, it, that would go on all night. A sound they would get to know well. Flakes of snow swirled and danced across the porch. The overlook faced it, as it had for nearly three quarters of a century. Its darkened windows now bearded with snow, indifferent to the fact that it was now cut off from the world. Or possibly, it was pleased with the prospect. Inside its shell, the three of them went about their early evening routine. Like microbes, trapped in the intestine of a monster. That is a great quote for a horror novel. 566. For a moment, he felt that death itself was outside that door. The feeling passed.
653. What are we at here? She looked older, and some of the laughter had gone from her face. Now, as she sat reading her book, Halloran saw a grave sort of beauty there that had been missing on the day he had first met her some nine months ago. Then, she had still been mostly girl. Now, she was a woman. A human being who had been dragged around to the dark side of the moon and had come back, able to put the pieces back together. But those pieces, Halloran thought, they never fit the same way again. Never in this world. And lastly, on page 658... The world's a hard place, Danny. It don't care. It don't hate you and me, but it don't love us either. Terrible things happen in the world, and there are things no one can explain. Good people die in bad, painful ways and leave folks that love them all alone. Sometimes it seems that only the bad people who stay that it's only the bad people who stay healthy and prosper. The world don't love you, but your mama does, and so do I. Um, I think those are pretty good quotes. We're doing all right on time. So let's get into talking about this novel as a work of literature. What are some things that uh, deserve to be discussed in this novel as a whole and in its entirety? Look, during the read-along itself, we were mainly positive. Uh, almost completely positive. Uh, so I think it's only fair that here we get to talk about some things that I wish that the, the novel had done better. Uh, but we're going to get there. I'd like to start this discussion with uh, The Shining as the novel. Not The Shining, but The Shining the novel as a metaphor. And as a metaphor for becoming an adult, for ascending uh, into adulthood. And the struggles that all of us go through. Struggles that are universal, perhaps, and if not universal by the name, father and mother, then by the roles of father and mother, if, if you understand what I mean by that. Um, we all lose our father, in here we lose our father, um, but with what do we associate our fathers? Is it work? Is it lack of work? Is it usefulness? Here, we dive deep into Jack's work. The whole family is enveloped in Jack's work. Uh, much in the way that someone of Stephen King's generation was expected to carry the entire family with his work. Um, along with that, we dive deep into the father figure's castle, the Overlook Hotel itself. We're all living there as well as his vices. So the entire family is exposed to the father figure's work, the father figure's place, the father figure's castle, and the father figure's vices. Those things which force him over the edge here, being alcohol mainly, but also being a dedication to work itself. Uh, therein, in work, we find a mentor, Dick Halloran. We find this mentor here through our father's work. Uh, and once we defeat our father, we burn down his castle. And in, in a fashion that would make Freud happy, we escape with our mother as our own. And she is older too. Remember that last quote there from 653 about her looking older. Uh, she is older and she is ours in what might be described as Oedipal bliss. But it's a hell of a thing, isn't it? That a novel about... And Danny comes along with his own gift. With the own something that he's good at. He's good at using The Shining. Uh, so he's going to grow up and use The Shining. Here he uses The Shining as his work as his contribution. Uh, in this way, he assumes adulthood. 
and it's something that is interesting to watch. Um, one of the other things that I had written down, but I never really found a place to talk about it. Jack is our, the reader's, entry point to this novel. We open the novel with Jack, alone with Jack. We end the novel with everyone but Jack. We end the novel with Danny and Wendy and Dick. So what is to be gleaned from that? It doesn't feel odd in its process. It doesn't feel like being shortchanged at the end. It feels pretty natural. A lot of that is due to the fact that Stephen King is a pretty expert storyteller. But there must be something, there must almost must be something else going on there, something that allows us to be all right with that. Is it because the father figure himself was consumed with work and overcome by the next generation? I don't know. Another thing which I think is worth discussing in this novel is Jack transcending to the Minotaur in the Labyrinth. One of the things that Stephen King does quite often is pay homage to Shirley Jackson. If you read, um, I think it happens in On Writing, but it most certainly happens in Dance Macabre, which is basically Stephen King's treatise on the horror genre. He talks about Shirley quite a bit. And one of the things that made The Haunting of Hill House quite the treat as a reader were the references to the labyrinth and to the minotaur running through it. And in here, Jack himself becomes the minotaur racing through the, through the maze. Danny is the virgin that had been sent to be sacrificed to the minotaur. Perhaps Wendy is the Ariadne figure. Um, I don't know, I didn't do too much work looking into that. In fact, I didn't do any during this novel, but I, I did. There is a read-along and a review for The Haunting of Hill House on the channel as well, if you're interested in that. Uh, but it is interesting to see that idea carry forth. Oftentimes, I think we are tempted to look at the, the symbol of the haunted house and see the ghosts themselves as the minotaur in the labyrinth. But that's not very dangerous, is it? Especially if this is a non-poltergeist type apparition who does not interact with the physical world in that way, in a violent way, in a manifest um, way. Jack, however, sure as hell can. And there is some question as to what is to be made of the fact If the ghosts of the Overlook Hotel, the spirit of the Overlook Hotel, whatever it is that haunts the halls of the Overlook Hotel, wanted Danny so badly, why didn't they kill him themselves? Why didn't it kill him itself? Why didn't that manifestation ruin Danny itself? Why did it need to create the Minotaur? Why did it need to possess Jack? <clears throat> One of the things which may have seemed conspicuously absent from my ongoing read-along for this novel uh, is the dissection, if you will, of names in this novel. One of the things that, if you've watched any number of read-alongs on this channel that you will know is that I really enjoy taking apart the names and seeing if there's anything baked into that part of the cake by the author. So what are we looking at here? Jack, what does Jack mean? Uh, Jack means God is gracious. Okay, Winifred, what does Winifred mean? Winifred means holy, blessed reconciliation or joy and peace. Danny, Daniel, what does Daniel mean? Daniel means God is my judge. One of the ways that um, 
And, 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 and so I have said that Stephen King is a great storyteller, but I don't hold him in that high regard as a writer. Um, what a writer... So this is often one of the things that becomes an argument between genre fiction and literary fiction. Which parts of the evolution of the living, breathing novel have been utilized by its author. Expert writers, literary fiction. One of the things that often happens is that names themselves provide some purchase onto the story so that we can climb that scaffolding uh, ourselves. And don't have to be given so many things. And if we get it, we get it. If we don't, we don't. Stephen King does not seem to, by what I can figure out, have placed very much emphasis on names themselves. Uh, what if Danny, the one who had The Shining, was known as Aiden, which means Little Fire, or Brent, which means uh, Dweller Near the Burnt Land, or Hugh, which means Mind and Intellect, or even Raymond, Ray, meaning Wise Protector, Ray also being a reference to uh, Light. Light being the shine, fire being the shine, fire, uh, little fire, Aiden being uh, the little shine. Uh, Brent, dweller near the burnt land, you read to the end of the novel, didn't you? Uh, Hugh being mind, intellect, points obviously to the great capabilities of Danny himself. What about Wendy being something like Camilla, which means attendant? which is very much what she is doing in the story, or Ariadne, uh, which may have been too direct a point to on the nose uh, for the Minotaur thing going on. But it also, Camilla would have given us a cross-horror uh, reference uh, to the, the novel by Francis, Francis Bernier. But also, uh, it would point directly back to The Haunting of Hill House. And what if Jack was known as Adam? Adam being Hebrew for man, being the first man. He's the prime man in this story, but also meaning to be read, R-E-D, to be read. We talked a lot about the uh, implications of the, the colors as we went along through this novel. Um, but I think that this is one of the areas where Stephen King leaves a lot on the table that could have been done and, and simply wasn't. And while I praise Stephen King as a storyteller, I think there are some things where writing-wise, it, it could be better. So what would I rate this? I would give this novel 88 Wasps' Nests out of 100. And what do I recommend? If you liked The Shining, you owe it to yourself to go back, read some Shirley Jackson, and read The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Because it is a, um, it is a horror prime novel. It is, a, it is one of the common denominators through the genre. That's all I've got for this episode of uh, Strip Cover Lit, and I hope to see you back for the next novel that we tear down.